Have you ever had a dream that you can't seem to wake up from? For example, I keep on having this weird dream where I bought a McLaren P1 that was in a hurricane, and for some reason I kept thinking that I could make it better than the factory ever did. I mean, <laughs> what kind of idiot would do that? Now there are several things you shouldn't do when buying a car. You definitely shouldn't buy a car that's been in a flood, especially not in salt water. Always inspect it before you buy it and test drive it if you can, never get it sight unseen. And above all else, always go to a qualified technician to diagnose any issues because doing it yourself could end badly. But as you can tell, I've done none of these things when it came to my flooded $2 million McLaren P1 because I knew my team and I could build it better. And to prove it, we stripped the car down to its carbon tub, dry ice cleaned it several times, installed a custom interior, exhaust, engine, bodywork, and wheels, and made the world's most insane rolling chassis before taking it across the country to the biggest car show on earth. And it's called... After scrambling for weeks to get the car ready, we finally opened the trailer in Las Vegas and pushed the P1 to the Valvoline booth. It was definitely a big hit. And since it was drawing a crowd, I figured I would tell the fine people at the show all about the very reasonable goals I had in mind for this project. This car is gonna be the fastest McLaren in the world. At least I hope so. Now, right now, the fastest McLaren in the world is the McLaren Speedtail, and it does about 250 miles an hour. What I wanted to do is have a car that was the true successor to the McLaren F1, which was the fastest car in the world in the 90s. And this car is not gonna be lighter. It's gonna be way more powerful. We have an engine back here that is completely modified by Cannonball Garage. And this is gonna have around 1300 to 1400 horsepower. And we should, well, hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, get to about 260 miles an hour. Now, uh, the person person doing that is actually uh, in the audience. You you said that, yeah, you said you would do it. Yeah, yeah, so this is uh, Ben Collins, the stick. Hello. Yeah, well, the, the former stick from top here. And uh, we have now become friends. Yes. And uh, I said, hey, would you like to drive a McLaren re really fast? I would love to drive this. I can't believe we've done with it. It's yeah. amazing. Lightweight, yeah. more power. Happy to do it. So, so Ben Collins and I, we're gonna we're gonna do something really interesting when the car's running. Now, over there, you'll see that's the actual color of the car, the brand new color that we made. Uh, so it is a gold pearl and a candy red. And this car, everything you see here, everything underneath the wrap is gonna be exposed carbon fiber. So it's uh, it's gonna look every bit of a hypercar, you know, that costs millions and millions of dollars. And that color, I'm calling Amber Dawn. Uh, because I, I feel like we need a custom color for a custom car. Now, I, I, I get emotional sometimes in my videos, you know, and right now I was, all, I was nervous, you know, coming to, the, coming to this place and showing you guys my car, but like, I'm, I'm among friends, I'm among uh, car guys, I'm among people that love this stuff and appreciate it for what it is. So I'm glad you guys came and uh, we're gonna do some really, really cool stuff in the coming year. Yeah. Woo Having the P1 at the show meant more than words could say. Sharing this experience and my biggest project, even in an unfinished state, was overwhelming in the best way. But if I'm being completely honest, it almost didn't happen. So I don't know if you guys know this, but last year was one of the toughest years of my life. I was dealing with divorce, depression, and burnout. And a lot of you actually did notice it, it came out in my videos. Now, if you are feeling like your life is spiraling and you have nowhere to go, then you should listen closely. Just waiting for these heavy feelings to pass doesn't really help. In fact, it can make things worse over time. I learned this the hard way. Like a lot of people, I actually thought that therapy was for people with serious mental health issues, not for people with normal life problems. But that is a huge misconception. 
This is where BetterHelp made a difference in my life. They're the sponsor of today's video and they've helped me see therapy in a new light. BetterHelp's approach is not just effective, it's a lifeline for those in need. It certainly was for me. Now over four million people have turned to BetterHelp to find happiness and health again. The process is straightforward. You visit their website using my link, betterhelp.com slash Tavarish, answer some questions, and then BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who understands what you're going through. They did this for me and it was a game changer and they'll do it for you. My therapist was there for me anytime, anywhere, helping me navigate through my divorce, depression, and the burnout that was weighing me down. It gave me all the support that I needed. Now, if you're facing tough times, do not ignore it. Go to betterhelp.com slash Tavarish. It's in the link in the video description below, and that will be your start to a happier, healthier life. And my viewers get 10% off their first month. That's betterhelp.com slash Tavarish. It actually did help me, and I hope it helps you as well. Now, take it from someone who's been there. Reaching out for help is oftentimes the best help you can give yourself. So let BetterHelp be the support you need. As the show came to a close, I knew that even though we got a lot done with this car, we still had a long, long road ahead. But when the car went back to my shop, I got a surprise visitor that gave me some much needed words of encouragement. Well, now we have somebody really, really special here. So we have F1 Elvis. So he is, well, you'll know him from Wheeler Dealers. And uh, he's here because he wants to, uh, talk about my McLaren P1 project. I actually asked him uh, what he thought. And <laughs> since he used to be an F1 mechanic and actually not just a mechanic, you did a lot more, didn't you? Well, yeah, I mean, I was at McLaren on the F1 team for, for 10 years. So I did start as a mechanic, but over those 10 years moved up through being part of the pit stop team and eventually into management. But yeah, this is a, a kind of trip somewhat down memory lane for me. And I absolutely love this project, man. You're doing incredible things with this. Well, I appreciate it because uh, I actually got a lot of uh, grief from people because I deleted the hybrid system and uh, I wanted to get, yeah, it is controversial. I know, I know. But I wanted to get your opinion because you guys at F1, you're all about power to weight. You're all about saving as much weight as possible, putting the power down. And I wanted to see what you thought about doing that to this car. Well, look, I mean, the hybrid system was designed for a specific use case, right? I mean, when you're driving these things around town, you want to be punching away from the traffic light Grand Prix, don't you? You want to win that race. Yes. You're going for something completely different now. It's all about top speed. And for that, you don't want to be carrying around that excess weight of all those heavy batteries. So I get why you've done it. And it kind of harks back to a sort of bygone era that everybody's craving more of which is brutal horsepower yeah. coming out of a combustion engine mm -hmm. and that is exactly what you're doing i'm really excited by that 1500 horsepower you want to get from this yeah that's uh that's the idea hopefully we get there uh everything here is experimental but i am super excited to get this all sort of working and running uh it's going to be a lot of work but uh i yeah. love that though being experimental is what I love most about this kind of engineering. You've got to make it up on the spot, haven't you? Mm -hmm. You kind of, there's no rule book, there's no instruction manual for this. Mm -hmm. You come up against a challenge, you might have to design something, make something, adapt something. And I kind of love that stuff. It's got to make it work as you go along. Okay, so that makes me really happy because uh, this guy actually worked at McLaren in their fastest car division, uh, and he likes this. So anybody in the comments that uh, thinks I took the soul out of this P1, then I don't know, take it up with him. I, I don't I don't know, but thank you very much, man. We're putting the soul back into it. That's yes, we doing. are absolutely putting so much soul back into this. It's gonna have soul coming out of its ears. <laughs> so, all right, well, thank you so much. Uh, we gotta get working on this car. With Elvis's kind words living rent-free in my brain, we took the engine and drivetrain out again so we can start prepping the car for its final assembly and modifications. But at this point, I do have to say that I am contractually obligated not to mention what we are actually doing but I can say it involved some cameras, some wrenches, and you may or may not see what we did in a future episode of a certain world-famous television show. Honestly, it was a bit complicated.
So we are changing gears a little bit to something a little bit easier, and that is this, the harness for the P1. Now this harness has been underwater, and it doesn't look very good, but we have cleaned it. We have uh, taken a lot of time to clean a lot of the corrosion off. And uh, I wanted to see if this is actually salvageable because I was gonna just put this back in the car and uh, clean it as much as I could. But I got an expert here and uh, he's, he's right here. Uh, so this is Adam from Smart EFI. And he has been working uh, with a lot of uh, ECUs and wiring harnesses. He used to uh, work for Haltech, correct? Yep. And um, he knows everything there is to know about uh, wiring harnesses and uh, he's gonna tell me if this is, if this is a good idea. I, I can already tell, like I, I'm looking at his face, it's not a good idea. Not a good idea. <laughs> not, that, uh, not that there's a, I know everything that there is to know. That was a very flattering introduction, I appreciate that. He part. said <laughs> he knows everything. What do you think uh, we can do with this harness? Because obviously it's had, you know, a lot of damage from the salt water. Salt water and copper connectors don't really go together, you know? Yeah, uh, generally electricity and water also isn't a good mix. And uh, this car was did have the battery hooked up, plugged in, installed, and then got submerged yeah. under a little bit of a little bit of salt water. Yeah, yeah, tiny bit. Um, so what a lot of people don't know about corrosion is that it doesn't just stop right at the surface. Okay. Um, so in this case, corrosion will travel down the wires. It corrodes the, the terminals at the connectors. Mm -hmm. It also will corrode inside the wire covering all the way down. It like wicks inside. So even if you have, you know, something like this, which is not a weather seal connector, um, you'll have corrosion up here and then it just goes whoop, like right into wherever. And uh, then you'll have a lot of um, electrical issues. But not only that, you mentioned something to me off camera and that is that, so these connectors, they are, um, they're made of metal. And when they corrode, the metal also can lose its elasticity. Like it, it can, it can be become more brittle, and they don't form good connections anymore. So even if the wire is okay, if the metal is still not as springy, you might have intermittent issues. And I think that's probably if we were just to put this harness in the car and try to clean it up, I think we'd be chasing a lot of those gremlins. Correct. The problem is not just the springiness, but when when metal corrodes. What happens is the surface layer of metal turns into corrosion, and then when you clean it off, you're taking that metal away. Yeah. Right. So then, if you try to put a, a pin in that same connection, mm -hmm. it's looser than it was originally because there's material missing. Yeah. So if you have loose connections, it may make a connection at one point, and then yeah. you wiggle it, and, and suddenly you lose it. it. Yeah. So in the case of just putting this in the car we would probably be chasing a thousand different electrical gremlins all at the same time, which is basically impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and anyone in their right mind would tell you to kill it with fire and okay. start over. Okay, well, it's a good thing that we're not in our right minds because uh, if if I were to go to McLaren, this would be this harness would be upwards of $20,000. That's a lot of money, but for a car like this, it's actually not that bad. The problem is it's a six month wait. And when McLaren tells you it's a six month wait, it's basically like, it's whenever. Uh, it could be a year, it could be two years, uh, the company might dissolve and then you still might not have your harness. So uh, we have to come up with the solution um, in a small amount of time that will remedy all of this. And boy, if you can come up with that solution and make this work, you are, Absolutely the man. I mean, you are you are the guy to, you know, he's the guy to go to for any sort of electrical uh, thing you might need. I mean, he makes custom harnesses and, and stuff, but uh, if he can make this work, I mean, you are a certified genius. Yeah, I, I would agree. If I could make this work, I would be a genius, but I can't make this work. Yeah, oh, no, don't, don't say that, don't say that, don't say that. We're gonna make this work. I have two other harnesses, two other harnesses for, there's a 720 and then maybe a 570 or a 650. And they're close enough to this, like all these connectors uh, that go to the fuse box, those are the same. So what I think we'll do is we're gonna start taking apart those harnesses and seeing uh, if the wires are the same, the wire colors, and if we could, you know, not necessarily splice them in like cutting and splicing, but if we can put them in into this harness and then see what else we need to kind of make new from whole cloth, I think that'll be like, I, I think we'll have a harness out of that. 
In my head, that's how it works. Maybe. We'll okay. see. Uh, so, yeah, our, our first order of business is going to be laying out harnesses side by side, comparing uh, what is where, lengths, connectors, all of that, and seeing what we can take from the good 720, 570, 650 mm-hmm. harnesses and basically patch back into this harness. Yeah. Um, because, like I was explaining, we're concerned about uh, the wires themselves deeper in the harness having yes. issues. Um, and instead of just trying to replace connectors yeah. and still having the same problems, mm-hmm. we're going to just try and kind of go end to end and start over with what we can. And then whatever we can't get from the 720 and 650 harnesses, we're going to make new okay, uh, and integrate that all together. Mm-hmm. And hopefully at the mm-hmm. end, have a, a whole working car. Now, this is something that you do for a living. Like you make harnesses for cars. So looking at this harness, how big it is and how complex it is, if someone were to, to just say, here you go, uh, figure this out, um, how much time and how much money do you think it would usually cost? That's a really hard estimate to make um, because it's it's not just straightforward, like planning a new harness and then building it. Yeah. You know. Planning and building a harness at this level, you know, you're probably talking about three to 500 hours Mm -hmm. of labor. So if you do that times $150 an hour, it gives you a rough ballpark plus probably $15,000 in parts. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's a, you know, good, pretty good estimate. But to do what we're talking about is significantly more complex because we're not designing something where we have all of the factory diagrams and we're building it all. Mm -hmm. We're having to diagnose and interpret McLaren's diagrams and then mate multiple harnesses together Mm -hmm. to Frankenstein one, you know, P1. Well, uh, when you say it like that, it sounds hard. There's a version of this that lives within these two, and then we like we put them together, and then it should be most of the way there. You know, it's like the three harnesses are gonna have a little threesome and make a yeah, it's harness like a little, baby. It's a little, little wiring orgy that we got right here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's an interesting one. That's that's exactly what we're doing. We're just we're just raw dogging this. <laughs> this is very very exciting. The most exciting thing you can do uh, on a YouTube video where you're re- rebuilding a car is wiring. Uh, because it takes forever and you can't see any progress. So, hope you like it. Although it looks like Adam and I are sitting on the floor and chatting next to a rat's nest of McLaren wiring, we're comparing each harness for connectors and wire colors. If both harnesses have the same plugs and wires, that's way less work that we need to do to make our custom P1 harness. And believe it or not, this process on its own took two full days. So we have mapped out both harnesses this is several hours later it's actually the next day and uh adam and i have been working hard with the tape and labeling everything but now comes the really extra fun part of taking off all of the sheathing this black sheathing that's all over both of the harnesses we're going to use and uh we need to now take every individual wire and uh run them exactly the way the p1 has And the way that we're gonna do it, well, we could just take the P1 harness and like splice and cut and do all that stuff, but that is not how McLaren would have done it from the factory. So Adam got the names and uh, types of these like connectors. There's plenty of different connectors all over the harness. And we're getting the correct wire colors because we do have the P1 wiring diagram and we just ordered all those. So we're gonna be actually 
pinning everything the way it would be from the factory. Unfortunately, those pins and wires and uh, connectors aren't here right now. So uh, we have to wait for those and that's probably gonna come up in the next episode, hopefully. Uh, but right now, we need to move on to something a little more pressing. Now let me tell you about something that actually has been a little bit of an issue. Now, this is the rear clamshell of the P1, and it looks fantastic. This is the only one of its kind. It has GTR flares, it has this little scoop for the active arrow, and it is a prototype part. And when something is a prototype part, that means that sometimes you get some fitment issues. And this is, well, we, we do have some fitment issues, unfortunately. So in order to fix this, because there are you know some gaps here that aren't exactly correct, there's a lot of tension in some of this where there shouldn't be. And realistically, this has never been fit to a car because the mold that they took it off of was on a race car and race cars, well, they don't have the best body work. So um, this definitely looks the part, at least on camera, but in order for us to get something that looks like a $4 million car, we're gonna need to do some work to it. And Jack, as you guys know, is really, really good at doing some body work, but this is also not exactly his uh, forte because he's doing body work in terms of like metal and fiberglass and that sort of thing. But this is carbon fiber. We actually have an expert here and his name is Sean. So Sean owns a really, really cool shop called Attack on the Clock. Yep. Yeah. And uh, he makes uh, very cool cars. I think I'm known for my uh, all carbon fiber 240Z that I built you know, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. K truck recently, R32 GTR, we've done a lot of, yeah, we've done a lot of, I think, cool stuff. This is uh, not only going to SEMA, but it's going to some other places. And uh, I also wanted to bring Jack along. This is this is quite a project, and I wanted to bring um, you know the experts in just to see what we can do, uh, just so you guys understand what the problem actually is with this car. Uh, when you open the door, so you can see that there's already some tension, like this. There, there's there's too much tension on the sides here, and we've already removed quite a bit. So, uh, Jack, what have you cut from this? Like a lot, a lot. A lot. We cut the sides off originally because we wanted to use the factory ones because they look a little bit better, a little more uh, cleaner, more streamlined. And then once we remove that, we realize, okay, well, let's try to put the inner structure of the clamshell, which is this stuff in here. We got a skeleton. And we tried to put that on, and then we realized we need to cut a little bit more off of that because we tried to keep the stock side pieces on the side and then kind of just blend them together. But the more we fit, the more we realized this thing didn't line up that well. So we ended up taking all these pieces off, cutting all these keep, things. Keep, keep, keep yeah. talking, keep talking, keep talking. Yeah. Thank yeah, you, yeah, thank yeah. you, thank you. Good, you're doing great, buddy. <laughs> so that's when we started thinking ourselves, what else do we gotta do? And me not being a carbon fiber guy, knowing a little bit about fiberglass molds, I was like, hey, I think we have to cut this apart in several places and then make the molds. But then we went to the expert over here and he actually gave us the same explanation. Yeah. So. Yeah, so it's uh, kind of like, you know, we're saying there's a lot of tension going on here. So you gotta figure out where those tension points are and kind of relieve it and relax it that way you can figure out all your smart cuts as opposed to just cutting everything in in half or you know this thing in thirds it's just painstaking process of figuring out what you know you can only you can't bring it back so yeah. you know, although we are gonna like make this thing look brand new you want to try to take off as least amount as possible yes. Uh, One of the things I was most concerned about is that, you know, this is going to be an exposed carbon fiber car. It's going to have a tint on it, but it's still going to be exposed so you can see the weave. And one big part of this is that the weave is, for the most part, uninterrupted. So uh, you can see the whole thing. It's not like cut up or, or anything, which is not what McLaren did because uh, this this door, it's like a patchwork quilt of carbon fiber and uh, it doesn't look very good once you sand the paint off, but uh, this is gonna look fantastic, hopefully. Um, but, uh, you know, Sean, he said, um, you know, I can have this done for you in about three hours. And I was like, that's crazy. That's crazy, that, that, that sounds like, that sounds like you're making it up. I mean, yeah, because you have the time machine, so yeah. I do have the three time machine. Three hours is no problem. I only need one hour if you got time machine. <laughs> Um, so realistically, you know, knowing our deadlines and, and everything, what do you, do you think that this is like a doable thing? 
definitely doable. I mean, it's a big project. We've definitely we're used to big projects, right? Um, so I, this isn't. This is a lot of work. It's not scary work. It's just precise okay. work, right? Because I'm scared. Yeah, I'm, I'm very scared. I mean, I've gotten kind of numb, probably like you too. Like, uh, they're just cars and they're just shapes. Mm -hmm. So a Civic front bumper's got a shape and a McLaren bumper's got a shape and they're honestly like yeah. both shapes, right? Yes. So, uh, the job is the job and yeah, it doesn't really scare me. That's it's a McLaren. I've cut up a lot of really expensive stuff. Absolutely. So um, I am going to, uh, well, hopefully this is a shape that you can you can accommodate. Um, we're gonna take this off and then we're gonna start working on uh, the mechanical aspects of the car. And uh, realistically, you know, once we have those in place, then we can sort of give you the chassis so you can put this on and then do your cuts and, and whatnot. But I feel like we should, uh, just so people know, we should go to your shop and like check out some of the toys you got. Yeah, it's a several hour journey. It's a several hour. <laughs> he is like 10 minutes away from me. Anybody that wants really, really good carbon fiber work and like custom build, like one off the best of the best, definitely go check him out. I'll put all your stuff in the link in the video description. But uh, you know, when, when you guys check this car out, when it's at SEMA or Goodwood or wherever, uh, then you can see uh, his handiwork, uh, hopefully. I'm, I'm hyping you up because I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just uh, I think the when you get it done It's just gonna look right. It's not gonna look customized. It's just gonna look like how it's supposed to look. Oh, you're saying the right words Okay, okay, let's go check it out Attacking the clock was absolutely next level Not only does Sean make his own carbon fiber panels for the various race cars and show cars he works on but he does all the fabrication and testing of his cars and when they look like this you better believe they perform just as good as they look. I'll post the entire 30 minute shop tour on my second channel, Two Varish, in the near future. But with the confidence that the P1's clamshell was in good hands, I was optimistic for the future. At least until I got a call that definitely put a turd in my punch bowl. And unfortunately, it has to do with this the brand new engine that we built from Cannonball Garage. Now it is nothing that has to do with the way the engine was built, but it actually has to do with the fact that it's going into a P1. So this engine is from a 720S, other than a few pieces. The things that go in here, so it's underneath the timing cover, they're called cam phasers, and I'll show you what they look like here from when we put the 675LT engine together. So they basically control the cam timing, and they allow the car to have better power, better efficiency, that sort of stuff. It's like variable valve control. Now on the P1, that is different from what you'd find on the 720. And since we're using a 720S harness and ECU, that isn't gonna play nice with our P1 everything else. So unfortunately, we found that out way later because nobody knew this. Nobody has taken apart a P1 engine and the guys at Cannonball Garage just so happened to be taking apart a P1 engine with cam phasers. And they said, hey, this might be a problem because uh, they're slightly different and they're not gonna play nice with all the sensors. So ultimately, I'm gonna have to take this apart, not all the way down, but definitely take the timing cover off, get new cam phasers for a 720, and then hopefully this should all go back together and then run. Now we have mechanical issues, we have issues with the body, and we have issues with the electronics. And uh, I'm still very optimistic that we can do this because I mean, obviously nobody's ever done this before, but I feel like with the team that we have in place, with the parts we have, and with everybody kind of cheering us on, I feel like we can do this. And just so you guys kind of don't lose sight of what we're doing, I want to give you a sneak preview of what the car is gonna look like. So I talked to my friend, Abby Melick Design. This guy, this guy makes every single really cool rendering that you've ever seen on the internet. Uh, he works for Motor Trend, and he's a personal friend of mine. So I asked him to show me what the finished P1 Evo is gonna look like. And ladies and gentlemen, here it is. What a waste of love. 